didn't get through all the ministries. But most of the ministries were able to make the presentations which they had prepared before. So having made it in front of other members of the government, it now affords all members of the cabinet to get a good overview of what is going on in the government and in the country. And where there are obstacles, we identify them and take decisions as to how we'll address them. And more importantly, because we are required to be even more careful now with the management of the funds, the whole question of how the funds flow from the Ministry of Finance to the various locations where money is being spent in the public system requires a kind of management which is tighter than before because it will not help us if funds are available in one area not being utilized and there's another area that desperately need that funding and the money is not going there. So the Ministry of Finance needs to have a very clear oversight as to who is spending what, who wants what, and to ensure that our limited resources are giving the service to the country in the best way possible by a better management of the flow of funds. That means that the, the, the communication between the various ministries and the Ministry of Finance, permanent secretaries in various ministries and the PSs in finance and so, that that communication has to be first class and uh, the caring and competence have to be the yardstick of the managers. So that's what we spend most of our time doing. And um, the cabinet met in caucus, and we also we met with the permanent secretaries as um, required, so we shared the time among. It has been a very um, useful exercise because we now um, have been able to set some specific timelines on some of the major things that we're doing. So let me just tell you a few of the decisions which I can mention. Um, with respect to national security, I did mention to you early on that we, this government's position is that we will have to work with what is available to us and that we will ensure that we do everything possible to afford the police service the best opportunity to be effective in responding to the lawless criminal element which seems to be getting more and more brazen in Trinidad and Tobago. These are facts that we can't run away from, but it is this government's position that the country's best response, notwithstanding other responses that may have to be made, but our best response is to have an, a well-organized, well-managed, and efficient and service, um, police service to respond to the criminal conduct of those of our citizens who attract the attention of the police. To do that, um, we have been supporting the Commissioner of Police and his management team, and we are, in fact, supporting the entire police corps, the men and women in uniform, and those who are not in uniform, to improve our ability, because it is our view that one of the major feelings of the country is the inability of the police service to keep pace and get on top of the criminal conduct in Trinidad and Tobago, as reflected by the relatively unsatisfactory level of detection and crime suppression, which we are experiencing. So in order to address that issue of the improvement of the police service, we talk about an, a manpower audit, meaning we want to ensure that we, as a nation, deploy, support, fund, train the relative requisite manpower to do the things that police need to do to discharge police duties in Trinidad and Tobago. This manpower audit will tell us who is there, what they are, how they are deployed, and how effective they are in their deployment. And if there are adjustments to be made, this will put the management of the police service in a better opportunity to make those adjustments. It is our view that um, some adjustments will be required. But we don't want to do it vai vai. We want to do it against the facts of the situation. So a committee um, detailed to conduct this manpower audit um, can be announced now. And um, that committee is expected to do this work and to report 
by March 31st. In other words, we've given them three months to get this exercise complete. And what they will generate is data that will allow us to respond to the need uh, to support or to prune or to trim or to relocate as the case might be. We had intended initially to um, await and largely rely on support from the British, but that support is, forth is forthcoming. But we will start at the local end first. And this committee would be chaired by Professor Ranish Deosaran, who has very wide experience in matters relating to the police service. Um, his own training at the university is in the whole question of crimin criminology. He's a sociologist, so the whole concept of the sociology of crime in Trinidad and Tobago is his forte. And he did have the opportunity to chair the Police Service Commission for a while. So he's infinitely familiar with our circumstance of policing all up there of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm very pleased that Professor Diosaran has agreed to chair this committee. And um, permanent, former head of the Public Service, um, Permanent Secretary Jackie Wilson, she is also going to be there. She's an HR expert. And we did ask the Commissioner of Police to supply two very senior officers to take part in this exercise and to detail them to work with this team. The Commissioner has um, gracefully, graciously ag agreed and he has named ACP Harold Phillip, who you might be familiar with because he acted as Commissioner of Police mm -hmm. while acting DCP? Yeah. Right. DCP Philip and ACP Christopher. These are very senior officers and Acting Commissioner Williams named them. We are also awaiting a nominee from the second division of the police service who will also um, come through the commissioner and would become part of this team. We also have um, a lawyer, Alan Miguel, who had worked with SORT at, in the early stage. And from Tobago, we have Dr. Levis, Guy Obiako. And um, this team, one more name would be added in the next day or two. So it will be an eight-man team. And this team would set about to examine the manpower, existence, and needs of the police service. And they will be serviced by the Ministry of National Security, providing the um, secretariat to them. And this exercise going through the Ministry of National Security is driven by the National Security Council holding the Ministry of National Security responsible for its discharge. And once the data get, gets back to us in April, the Cabinet stands ready to assist the Commissioner of Police and his management team and whatever recommendations they make, the government would be um, prepared to look at those recommendations and I'm sure it would be of great value to the management of the police service and other um, entities in national security. All of this is part of our effort to strengthen and to focus on an improvement of the police service. Let's understand something. We spent approximately $25 billion on policing in the last 10 years, 21 billion over 10 years. This is a lot of resources. And we have um, almost 6,000 officers on the payroll, and in that kind of scenario, we are having as a national response that the criminal element is not sufficiently suppressed in Trinidad and Tobago. We just have to have a better and more effective police arrangement, and that is what this is about. Another issue which we discussed in the Ministry of Health um, among the other things where I can talk about particularly, the new Coover Hospital. Um, we did say earlier on that we had asked UDICOT to invite proposals from interested parties who may see opportunities or want to partner with the government to operate this facility so as to reduce the strain on the public purse while ensuring that it becomes a contributor to the national healthcare delivery system. Um, UDICOT did receive some responses, and that having been done, the Ministry of Planning and Development now takes over the exercise 
and tomorrow the cabinet will receive a note to appoint an evaluation committee to evaluate these proposals, whatever they might be, coming from wherever. And in so far as there is any proposal there which meets the government's satisfaction, and the government would be advised by this committee, which I'm now going to announce, we will then determine what happens to that facility. And the committee is to be chaired by a former permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance, which is Alison Lewis. She will be assisted in her team by former head of the public service, Sandra Marchak. There will be Dr. Stacey Shamley, businessman Zamir Ali, former head of the nursing council, Mrs. Gwendolyn Louis Snags, uh, quantity surveyor Rupert Reese, and Dr. Robin Hussein, a medical doctor. This team would look at the proposals put to the government and make recommendations, and they would be authorized to consult um, as they see fit in setting about to make these recommendations to the government. Another um, set of RFPs that we had invited had to do with the use of the site in St. Clair, which is now occupied by the Ministry of Agriculture. As you would know, the government had as, um, announced early on that the Ministry of Agriculture is to be relocated to Central, to Freeport, you know, is it, um, in, the motor, um, in Chaguanas, in Endeavour. And when the ministry is relocated, in fact, we haven't been able to do that so far because in attempting to do the relocation, there were some issues with that building. The building was discovered, the building in Endeavour was discovered to require some retrofitting to meet, meet certain standards. It had not met the structural standards of the Ministry of Works and we've had to do some work on it. We expect that that would be completed in the not too distant future. And in vacating that site in St. Clair, it was the government's intention, as per the RFPs, we've invited persons to make proposals to the government to use that site for a high-class hotel. And we're doing this against the background that elsewhere in our development, we want to uh, promote Port of Spain as a convention location. And to do that successfully, we need to increase the number of available quality hotel rooms. Because if we do have a, a large enough quantity of hotel rooms, we can attract certain kinds of convention, especially around Carnival as a festival and other festivals, around Easter and other parts of the year because of our weather. And of course, we have a very large diaspora abroad which we intend to engage going forward. And these things are part of our economic expansion going forward. So if that site could attract private sector investment or partnership with the government, we will see what proposals we have. And we do have some proposals. I understand that there were some responses to the invitation. And we're putting a committee in place to, again, evaluate what has been put and to advise the government as to what um, is a good course of action. So the government would be advised by this little team. The team is to be chaired by Imtiaz Ahmad, who is now chairman of ETEC. ETEC, which um, now manages the government's uh, portfolio of hotels in Trinidad and Tobago. And Robert Green, a business, a business executive. Zanim Ali, also a businessman, and Christian Lowe. Those four persons will evaluate the proposals with respect to the use of that site. If we are hopeful that we can find some arrangement that we can engage and um, press on with some economic activity on this, on this site. To come back to the Ministry of Health, we did discuss the national profile and the work to be done. As you know, we have some significant challenges, not just Coover. We have the point 14 hospital that's under construction, and I may tell you that there are some difficulties with that site, but the work is going to be made to go on, but there are some difficulties on the financing side and the arrangements. It was supposed to be a government-to-government -government arrangement, but um, those things are not being executed. Um, so we're having to carry the construction without the benefit of that arrangement. The one in Arima, was also supposed to be a government-to-government -government arrangement, 
um, with the Chinese. But again, um, there were no arrangements in place to execute that. And as we sought to um, gel that in the just concluded year, we discovered that the financing arrangements as proposed in these projects are not the best arrangements that the country could afford. There are some difficulties and some unnecessaries, and the Minister of Finance is sorting that out now. It may turn out that rather than go with the funding as initially um, outlined in government to government, that we may find uh, more attractive funding, cheaper funding on the non-government to government market. But one, there's one um, problem with the country in that in the eastern borders from Mayaro, that area from Mayaro around to Matlock, centered on San Grigandi, there is a real need for a hospital. And the cabinet's taken the decision to proceed with that, that uh, solution. And the site has been chosen for a new hospital in San Grigandi. Um, user briefs have been cleared, and the consultant would be authorized now to proceed to um, take steps to prepare us for a new hospital in San Grigandi. How that is going to be funded will be the subject of future conversations with you, but the Minister of Finance will have to look into that. But the decision to um, fill that um, space in the healthcare delivery system. San Grande Hospital, interestingly enough, um, is rated as one of the better hospitals in terms of healthcare delivery in the country. But it is, in fact, one of the most um, antiquated of our structures. And in fact, if I'm, my memory serves me right, part of the healthcare delivery up there is in sheds and containers. And the staff up there really needs our gratitude for delivering the service under those conditions. So a new hospital and San Grande is part of our development program. With respect to the social service delivery area, we had some discussions on that. And we have determined that there are so many um, problems associated with CPEP, problems of the contractors owing the government's large sum, the government large sums of money for income tax or NIS, and the, the whole the whole thing has gone astray. It was a proposal that had good ideas to be a nursery for a small business. We still subscribe to that. There's a place for that, but it has gone so far of its moorings that we have decided that it will be comprehensively reviewed. And in that review, a decision was taken that in utilizing the manpower associated with CPEP and the government support of that manpower, that we will have a three-prong, three-way arrangement where the company will remain with the Ministry of Local Government and provide to local government um, the contractors that the local government need to do the work that local government would do. And a portion of that allocation of the resources to CPEP will go to the Ministry of Agriculture, which is currently engaged in a commercial forestry expansion. I am sure you would have heard us saying before, very early in our tenure, that we will expand the commercial forestry acreage in the country, replanting areas of teak and pine where we have such acreage available. And uh, we also expand the species into mahogany, upper mat, sip, and so on. And we would invest the CPEP effort in the Ministry of Agriculture into planting acreage of these things. So we had the nurseries, and we created two new nurseries, one in Ecclesville and one at Cats Hill. And we do have in hand now, as a result of this initiative, we have almost uh, we have 450,000 seedlings available, and when the rains come in May of this year, we can begin to plant the acreage that we earmark. And this will put the CPEP people in agriculture into good productive work where we are planting these acreage, and out of it will come 
sometime in the not too distant future, acreage of forest which can be utilized in the country as part of our timber base. You only have to look at what happens now with the teak plantations that we harvest now and see how valuable they are to the current economy to know what this effort will do going forward. So that is an exercise in the agriculture ministry. And the third one is um, in the Ministry of Works, where CPEP in the urban areas would be managed by the Ministry of Works doing the cleansing that they do in the areas that you are familiar with. So it's Ministry of Local Government, Ministry of Agriculture, and Ministry of Works. And that review and um, adjustments would come by the in the coming weeks by the relevant <coughs> ministers. Um, we are now clear to restart the point 14, the, 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 the highway to point 14 from, what is it, DB now, DB to point 14. However, we had stopped that project, but well, we didn't stop it, we fired the contractor. The project was stopped before we came into office but the contractor was still there. And when we called upon the contractor to restart and continue the project, the contract contractor could not. You would have been told by Minister Stuart Young at an earlier time, having um, stopped the con fired the contractor, we then um, went after the bonds which had bonded that project. The contract, the, the bonding banks, the banks that had put up the bonds to protect the government's money in that project resisted the payment of the letter of credit. We had to go to court in London and elsewhere. And fortunately, we have won those lawsuits and we have in hand virtually all the money bar one bank. There's one bank with a small portion of the money, but we have recovered um, approaching a billion dollars. And we have been cleared by our lawyers, local and international, to begin to take over the project and to restart it. So the program that we've discussed, which is now clear to go forward, is that tenders will be invited, mainly expecting local contractors or local contractors partnered by any partner of theirs during this month of January. And it is the government's intention not to award this contract for the, for the finishing to one contractor. It will be about two or three or four pieces. So segments of the road would be awarded to different contractors. That is to ensure that there's local participation. Because if the project is too large, what we have discovered, that if the project is too large, by its very size, it rules out the participation of local contractors as primary contractors on any award. But if we break it up into sizes that local contractors can manage, then we give them the opportunity, and this is giving life to what we have said before, that we will give local contractors the opportunity to do what we know they can do. So during this month of January, the tenders would be invited. We expect that we'll get a good response from the contractors who are waiting for work, and that construction should begin um, by the end of March, early April, by the time the contractors will put their bids in, evaluation takes place, and awards to be made. So midway during the dry season, we expect to restart this effort to build a highway to point 14. With respect to the Valencia Toko Highway, which is a new road, which we've said a lot about, which is the road to open up the eastern part of Trinidad and to link us to Tobago, um, we have had the consultant, as you were told before. We have now settled on the route. We have agreed on the, the, the actual route where that new road will be built. So the consultant is now cleared to go ahead with route design, and that most of um, this uh, significant portion of this year will be spent doing the engineering designs. And while that is going on, simultaneously, we will be inviting tenders, um, and that is to be done uh, in the very near future for the Toko port itself, which will approach that the port on a design build basis. In the case of the roadway, we are now doing the designs, and then contractors will be invited to bid, to build segments. We'll do it segmented in the same way we do the Point Fortin Highway. We will not be given one contractor, the whole project. It will be given 
um, in segments at, and so that different sections of the road, different contractors would be on the job. And while that is going on, another contractor would have tendered and the successful contractor would be on a design bill basis be doing the port. Um, and uh, we expect, we are, we are going out to tender for the already designed portion of the Kumoto to Manzalina Highway. The portion that is already designed, we are going out to tender in early March. And that means that construction should begin um, by the end of April on that as well. So that is an other project that will kick off during the middle of dry season, the Kumoto to Manzanilla Highway in first phase. There's a piece of it to be designed to take us into Manzanilla, but while that design is going on, the area for which the design is complete would be under construction. Um, we have taken a decision at the level of the cabinet to provide management to Napa and Sapa based on the Queen's Hall model. The Queen's Hall model has worked extremely well and uh, the persons who run Queen's Hall deserve congratulations. The state has expended some significant sums to upgrade Queen's Hall, but by and large it's a venue which is a good model. We are not entirely enthused by the way the ministry um, is the responsible agency for Napa. Napa is a major national investment and we need to maximize its use and to ensure that it's properly maintained and put proper procedures in place for its use. Associated with Napa is a hotel, as you know, um, there's a 50 room hotel associated there. And uh, very soon, in the next week or two, um, we are inviting proposals from the business community to operate that hotel, and uh, we are hoping that we get positive responses. So the board that we're gonna put in place for Napa would be responsible for the whole arrangement there. And in the South, an, an, another board, a different board, but with similar responsibilities on the same Queen's Hall model will take responsibility for Sapa. We are very concerned about maintenance of these facilities and full and maximum use for a national benefit. As you all are aware, before I go off, um, we are approaching the completion of the renovation of Stolmeyer Castle, which is, the, which, is, which is one of the magnificent seven buildings which falls under the uh, committee which I chair. <coughs> Excuse me. And the cabinet very soon will determine what use that building will be put to. Very soon, the cabinet will take a decision on how we will utilize this iconic building. Work is proceeding apace on the others. There's a lot of preparatory work to be done. I've, I've seen it said by somebody who professed to be in the know recently, as is normal here, not, not knowing what is going on. Assume that nothing has gone on since we had said to you that this would be going on. The truth of the matter is that a lot of work has gone on. The architects and the engineers have been at work. Um, the preparatory work is largely finished for President's House. We have cleaned out President's House. The, the, the preparations to begin, thank you, to begin renovation um, are well advanced. Same thing with Queen's Hall. And the engineering assessment of Bill Fleur is about complete. And therefore, we are in a position very soon to begin to um, the, the preparations on actual physical works. You see, these renovations are not things you can just run in and start to build. A lot of the preparatory work has to be done. It's very time consuming and it's very specialist work. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the foundation of mill flow, engineers. We spend a lot of time um, on Queen's Hall, and it's only after you've done all that work 
and get everything in place that you can begin any kind of construction. But um, very soon we will be doing the construction work on Whitehall. And um, the tender packages are ready. And of course, you will have seen for the Parliament a number of packages which have begun to be advertised. The last one I saw was the woodwork and the roofing of the Parliament. I think there are, there are 19 packages, or 19 is by and large stadium. But there are a number of packages of work which came out of the assessment exercises for all of these buildings. In the case of the Parliament, there was um, re retrofitting work. Um, there's one with asbestos removal, and so on and so on. So all of these things are preparatory to the work. And we are still hoping to have the Red House ready by mid 2018 or October 2018. We are on track for that. So June 2017, the construction would begin after we've done all these preparatory work and specialist engineering work and so on. There are 47 state enterprises, either wholly owned, majority owned, or partially owned in some form. And those enterprises have a number of subsidiaries, resulting in there being, I think, 103 companies in this country which are deemed as state enterprises. So we regard them as a state enterprise sector. 103 companies of which more than 50 are subsidiaries, but there are 47 main state enterprises. One of the things that have been happening is that these enterprises have grown in their importance in the national economy to the point where today they are responsible for a huge chunk of expenditure of the national budget. And the management of these enterprises, boards and management of these enterprises, have responsibilities in some instances way beyond the uh, breadth of some ministries. And that being so, it is extremely important that the government of Trinidad and Tobago pay better attention to the management of the state enterprise sector. There are a number of negatives that are now attending this sector. A series of scandals, financial and otherwise, come out of this sector. And there are huge leaks of funding because of inappropriate management in some aspects of the state enterprise sector. This cannot be allowed to continue, especially at this time where we do not have money to play loose with. Even when we have money, this system ought not to be allowed to continue. And it is continuing largely because the reporting as is required sometimes by law for some of these agencies, is not taking place. Reports are normally late or deficient, and it is the accepted state of affairs, both by those for whom the report is intended and those who are required to produce the report, it is now the accepted state of life that there's no problem if the report is not produced or if it is late, or if you can simply just say, well, I can't submit the report because we all know that audited financial statements take three or four years to be cleared. Well, the government has taken a decision today in this retreat that that will not be allowed to continue. So tomorrow, the Minister of Finance will issue a very firm and clear circular memorandum to all state enterprise managers and their boards, in particular, particularly the managers who are the permanent establishment of the agencies, and for whom reporting how they handle state resources is their job, that the corporation soul, meaning the Minister of Finance who has the corporation soul responsibility, would require all managers by March 31st to submit annual financial reports in whatever state they exist. 
the Minister of Finance will not tolerate the absence of a report on the basis that the report is not an audited financial statement. The circular tomorrow will tell managers that they are to prepare their financial statements by year end as required, and whether they audited or not, such a statement must be made available for the site of Corporation Soul, who will view it as an audited or an unaudited financial statement. But whatever the report contains, that report must be known to the Corporation Soul soon after the financial year. And the circular memorandum ends on the note that failure to comply with this directive would have serious consequences for those who fail to comply. And the government is firm in that. Because any management that is too busy doing other things, that they can't report on how they spent the millions and billions that they spent during the year, is a management to watch. And therefore, if we are to improve the management in the state enterprise sector and ameliorate and, in fact, eliminate the levels of unacceptable conduct in the state enterprise sector, we start with this circular memorandum where managers who are required to manage are also to report because those who are required to monitor the activities of these agencies cannot do so in the absence of timely reporting from the agencies. As it stands now, even at the level of the cabinet, in many instances, we are informed of what goes on or what went on in a state enterprise when the media reports largely of something of wrongdoing or something of a scandal. That is not how we run this very large part of our economy or this very large part of the state's investment portfolio. You will also be aware that the procurement legislation is due to be proclaimed soon. And that was one of the issues that we mulled over here with the PSAs because there are certain requirements. This law has certain requirements where every government department has to be prepared to respond to this law because procurement of goods and services would be done on the specific statute once this law is assented to. And therefore, all ministries, all government departments have to have prepared their uh, themselves to be able to comply with the law. And um, it also involves the disposal of public property. So when this proclamation takes place, the assent is done, and this law kicks in, as we expect to happen by the end of March, we have one thing to do in the parliament, and it, it goes or has been. Yeah, we, we, have a, we have an adjustment to make, which has already, I'm advised by the Attorney General, it has already been ag agreed in the Joint Select Committee. And I think that has to do with the di Director General. Yeah, the, 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 the existing law, as has been passed, has a term of office for the Director General of seven years. It is the view of this Parliament on both sides that seven years may be too long to contract someone in a job especially a job of this nature. And we are going to amend the law to reduce that tenure from seven years to five years. Once we do that, um, we will then proceed to take steps to go through to have this law proclaimed and implemented by April 1st, which means that we have 12 weeks to kick this in and the PSCs have gone away. Um, knowing that this is so, they were advised before they knew, but now we have had to sharpen their observation and inform their preparation as we go forward. Um, so basically, those are the announcements we want to make arising out of some of the discussions we've had. We've had very lengthy discussions with some ministries more than others. Um, but the general feeling is that we have used the time to um, fine tune the governing response as we go forward into 2017. Um, 
we see 2017 as a year when we would begin to deliver. 2016 was largely a year of holding um, and trying to position the country to treat with what had befallen us in late 2010, in late 2015 into 2016. We now have a, even though the oil prices are not anywhere near where they were, say two years ago, they have improved considerably from $28 a barrel, because that's where they were at some time in 2016. We are now hovering, the benchmark is hovering at $54. But of course, no, we don't get that. We get a bit less for our um, slightly less quality crude. But it's a long way from $28 to um, 40, 45 or 44 we get, or something like that. So while we are required to acknowledge, as we must, that our circumstances are still very challenging, I don't want anybody to get the impression that we are out of the woods. The circumstances are still very challenging because our expenditure levels in 2015 were and continue to be well beyond our revenue levels. Revenue levels. But some of the things that I've outlined here will generate economic activity which will move some money in the system and bring about relief to those persons for whom opportunity to participate had been denied because of the suppression of certain governmental expenditures. But in terms of earning revenue as a country, um, some announcements that I, can, I, I ought not to make now, but I can tell you that work is going on with respect to our, our intention to expand our economy based on our strengths. We are looking very closely at what we can do with our electricity production in furthering our economic expansion. We have some proposals that we have to consider, which we are considering now with respect to the uh, industrial economic side of the country. And um, a couple of them are quite exciting, but they require more behind the closed door attention, and you will be informed along the way. But we do have some negatives as well that we have to keep in sight. For example, um, we have we are facing some very, very serious challenges with respect to NGC rationing gas to Point Lisas. And some of the companies there are not entirely happy by the nature of the rationing, not just the rationing itself, but the nature of the rationing. And um, NGC has some very serious challenges. In one particular instance, there are a couple of plants which are down for lack of gas, a couple of plants which are performing below their peak and um, the outlook for gas to those plants is not very good in the immediate future. But it's not all bad news. In the middle of this month, a platform that has been spawned in Labrie, some of it completed in Texas, is now in Labrie and ready to go to sea on the 15th of January. And um, we should be very proud that we took part in building a structure of that nature in Trinidad and Tobago at Union Estate. And that's going out to field to bring in one of our gas fields. And that gas should be um, available to us in the medium, in the not, not tomorrow, but in the not too distant future. But that's the kind of thing we have to do to turn around the existence of this gas shortage. O over and above the price issue that we are facing in oil, the price in gas has rebounded fairly well. We have budgeted at 225, is it? Mm -hmm. And we are now getting the, the benchmark price is 325 or something like that. So the gas price has, but at the same time, our gas production has fallen, as oil has fallen. So all of these negatives have created a perfect storm for us as a people. But we simply have to be reasonable in our actions, responsible in our actions, positive in our actions, confident in our ability to overcome these difficulties. And one by one, we expect them to recede on the horizon and be replaced by um, a fairer circumstance. So those are my comments to you, and I'm sure you have some comments, which are some questions you may want to ask, and I will try to assist, uh, assist you if I am able to. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Depending on the issue of the oil and gas sector, uh, we do have a situation at PetroTrend with the OWTU threatening 90-day uh, strike. Uh, the 
they're saying now they've served the notice, but there's a grace period until Monday. Is this something that uh, the cabinet was monitoring while it was in retreat? Oh, we have been monitoring this situation from the very beginning, not, not only during the retreat. Um, this situation did not develop overnight. Up to many persons who are now paying attention, um, the fact that we have reached the stage of a strike notice might be attracting the attention because of the consequences of that. But this is not something that has been developing overnight, and we have been monitoring it for quite some time, even as it escalated to the point of the, um, break, the breakdown. And let me just correct, let me just, for the benefit of the public, especially those persons who um, may want to review the country's history. You remember when Minister Imbert made his comment about 000 at that meeting at the Hyatt? He was excoriated by a lot of people, quite properly so, I should say. But one of those who excoriated him was the opposition leader, who was the former prime minister. And we came out of a local government election last October, November, and the campaign against the PNM was this 000 comment. I want to draw your attention to the fact that Petrotrin, as a state company, last had an agreement with its representative union in 2011. The last agreement that was signed, 2011. And you would have heard the government of the day and the government that went out of office then use statements like this, that they have settled all outstanding negotiations. You must, you must have heard that. And they, gave, uh, and they gave a number, I think it was 65 or 165. But they were never able to tell you which are these agreements that they settled. But they told you that they had settled that all the agreements. What they didn't tell you is that that government, in a time of plenty, had offered via Petrotrin, because we, 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 we speak synonymously Petrotrin and government, one and the same, but Petrotrin is a state company owned by the government 100% and the shareholder has some say in what the company does. The offer to Petrotrin in 2011, by the offer to the union, by Petrotrin in 2011, was zero, zero, zero. For the period 2011 to 2015. So what I said to you a while ago when Mr. Imbert made his comment that this government has made no offer of 000 to any entity, I was waiting to hear if those who had made an offer would have said we did. But they didn't. Because when they made that offer, that was the basis of the negotiation for the 2011 to 2015 period. The union quite expectedly refused the offer and they went into negotiation. On the 28th of November, 2013, the 28th of November, 2013, the negotiations for the period 2011 to 2015 commenced. They had 29 meetings during that period on that basis. And on the 24th, and on the 10th of November, 2014, Petrotrin referred the negotiations with the ODBTU for the 2011 to 2015 period as a trade dispute to the Ministry of Labor. So by 2014, November 10th, there was a breakdown in the negotiations and a referral as the law requires to the Ministry of Labor. There, were f there was a 14-day conciliation period. Conciliation was entered into and the parties continued. Following this period of conciliation of 14 days, at midnight, November 24th, for the seven-day period commenced, 
during which OWTU and the company could have served strike notice or lockout. Neither party did that. And that expired on the 4th of December, 2014. And that was for the period 2011 to 2015. They got to the point by way of the legal processes at the Ministry of Labor where either party could have sold notice, the union could have called strike notice, or the company could have locked up the union. They didn't do that. But the matter was referred to the industrial court on the 5th of December, 2014. And during the intervening period, there were informal contact between them. So this matter, for the period 2011 to 2015, which started with a 000, that is at the industrial court. The court made certain comments and sent the parties back to see whether further conciliation could bring about some agreement. Today, while we were here in the retreat, the parties in this process, this very process for 2011 to 2015, had to turn up in the industrial court as required by the law. I'm advised that the matter was put, um, adjourned to Friday, but the matter is at the industrial court. It is for the industrial court, in the scheme of things in this process, to make a ruling as to what is a fair offer to the union by those who employ the union's members for the period 2011 to 2015. And I think everybody knows that. I think the union knows that. I think we all know that. However, that being the case, um, we've had contact with the union, informal contacts, not in negotiation, but talking to the government, talking to the Minister of Labor, and so on. And the next thing we knew, and this is where the surprise came, the next thing we knew, negotiations for the period 2015 to 2017 commenced and became a bone of contention because the union was making a request for a certain percentage increase and the company offered, this company now, under this government, has offered zero, zero, zero. So the union has an argument that the last government offered us zero, zero, zero for 2011 to 2015, and this government is now offering us zero, zero, zero for 20, up to 2017, and therefore the governments of Trinidad and Tobago are offering us workers at Petrotrin zero, zero, zero over a six-year period. That is not exactly what the picture is because, as I said, they are the industrial court for the t up to 2015 contesting what would happen for that period. And it is now for that to come to a reasonable end. And of course, if reason or if both parties can agree to something, the law permits for the matter to be withdrawn from the court. But both parties have to agree for that to happen. I don't know that the discussions have gone in that direction. Overnight, the matter escalated to strike threat and today the serving of strike notice. I simply want to say that the government wants the best for all citizens. The government wants the best for all state employees. Petrochin is a state, state company which affords the opportunity for some of our citizens to enjoy some of the best conditions available in the country. But collective bargaining is an integral part of our societal arrangements, and there's a process to be followed. What I think we're being asked to do as a government, by way of the company that the state owns, because the government doesn't own the company, the government is just a manager. The taxpayers own Petrotrin. And what in the face of what is at the industrial court, and what would have triggered the strike action, the government on behalf of taxpayers being, uh, being, uh, is being asked to make an offer, and I presume enter into an agreement for the period 2015 to 2017, 
not knowing what the conclusion is for the period 2011 to 2015. As Prime Minister, who wants the best for all our citizens and want the best for our employees at Petrochewin, I think it would be irresponsible on the part of the government to enter into that arrangement, to offer and execute an increase on Petrochewin's payroll for 2015 to 2017, not knowing what that percentage increase will apply to. I think it is more reasonable for us to conclude the period 2011 to 2015, and then we will know that becomes the base on which the period 2015 to 2017 can be concluded. I expect that reason and common sense will prevail. The government is not hostile to the union. The government is not disrespectful to the union. The government has a responsibility to the wider national community. I can tell you, a 1% increase involves hundreds of millions of dollars. Just bear that in mind. And as Petrochewin's ability to pay now on any increase, any increase now, is a charge on the exchequer in some form or some fashion. Because currently, the company is basically, at this particular time, it wasn't always so, and we expect it wouldn't always be so. But at this particular point in time, Petrochewin is, a, in effect, a ward of the Ministry of Finance. And we'll have a lot more to say later. What I can say now is that even as we are facing these challenges, which I'm sure the responsible and venerable OWTU will regard as their duty to be reasonable to the people of Trinidad and to be going to themselves in the process. When we get over this, or even as we are getting over this, we are having a challenge, and that challenge would be to rectify the situation at Petrochewin so it does not continue to be a ward of the Ministry of Finance. That is one of the major challenges faced by this government today. As Prime Minister and as head of the National Security Council, are you satisfied uh, with any contingency plan involving the Defense Force and so on, if in fact there is a strike from Monday? The government's responsibility is to service the entire country. And when there's a strike or an emergency of a landslide, or a fire at the hospital, the government is duty-bound to be ready to respond. And if it gets to that, we will respond appropriately to ensure that the public's in public inconvenience is minimized or eliminated. Can I ask, what significance does the government attach to job security versus wage increases? And do you think that um, Petrotrin is a legitimate charge on public expenditure? Well, I don't want to have that discussion at this time for fear that um, I could be accused of inflaming an already uh, sensitive situation. I would want the situation now to be treated with a with, um, limited amount of in apparent inflammatory comment, particularly coming from me. However, the Minister of, of Labor in the intervening period is meeting at the request of the union, with the union tomorrow, and the law laid down certain steps that must take place, and there will be opportunity for people to talk. And I'm an optimist, and I expect that in these uh, kinds of situations, at the end of the day, reason will prevail. And I simply want to say to all involved that 2016 is not 2010, is not 2008. 2008 was the best earning year of the government of Trinidad and Tobago from the energy sector. 2009 was also a good year, and that went on into early 2010. 
from mid, sorry, yeah, from 2015. From mid-2015, we got ourselves into a very difficult situation. And I may, I may say something else too. In 2011, when this company, this state company, was guided by way of a zero, 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 the government that did that afforded during that period 2011 to 2015 14% increases to other state employees and while the company workers are not public servants to be viewed as state employees as such they are engaged in a commercial enterprise we all know in the context of collective bargaining in Trinidad and Tobago there's some relationship between the various paymasters and the governments the government is a paymaster at Petrotrain, at TSTT, at the Ministry of Finance, wherever public servants work. There's some relationship there. In fact, some persons will tell you it is what public servants get in their negotiation that sets the tone for what others will get outside the public service. And it has been so for quite some time. But when one set of people were given 14% and another set was given 0-0, zero, zero, the people who did that should shut up. This morning I saw one of them on television accusing this government of not showing leadership. Well, if that is their idea of leadership, then we don't want to be that kind of leader. We want to be a leader that appeals to all the people in Trinidad and Tobago and to say that we will go as a progressive nation once all of us are rowing in the same direction. context of the fact that the Industrial Court had given an award with Anselm Mikhail, and at the end of it, the company just shut down. So I, I was looking at it from the point of view of, the, you know, whether yeah. an award... Well, I, I don't know that it was an award. I mean, it was a, it was a, there was a contentious matter of some outstanding monies. Right. The, 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 the company didn't want, in the Arcelor Metal case, it wasn't a percent increase or anything like that. There were some monies owed to the workers. It was accepted and not appealed by the company being paid off by the receiver. But, um, but at the time when the, when the company folded up, um, they, they won uh, in the court. But the Arcelor Metal was a private company. And all private companies exist at the behest of the, of, of the owner, the shareholder. Petrotrin is also company under the Companies Act, but is owned by the wider national community. Every citizen of this country is a shareholder in Petrotrin. And whatever decisions Petrotrin make has to take into account that it is beholden to the wider national interest. And there are some conversations where it can be said that Petrotrin's fortunes or lack thereof are threatening the wider national community. And it's against that background that we have to determine what happens at Petrotrin. We have a challenge now to deal with. We will deal with it, but rest assured, it will be dealt with in the context of the wider national community, taking into account any legitimate claim of the workers involved. And secondly, the company as an entity is attracting and will attract the attention of the cabinet with respect to corrective action that can, will, and must be taken in the very near future. Position that it, it is paying, the workers are paying the price for expensive mistakes made in the past. That might be true, but the bottom line is how will that help us by, by worsening it? I have no doubt that mistakes were made at Petrochin, but to compound the mistake or to not seek to improve the situation, what I do know is that whether it's my fault or your fault or his fault or her fault, there's a requirement to put Petrotrin in a situation where it cannot be properly described as a ward of the state. Prime Minister, um, I don't know if you're aware, um, the, police, the Police Social and Welfare Association has signaled its intention to begin waging salary negotiations on Friday. And they are saying they will not be accepting any zero zero offer. What is your comment on that? I won't comment on that. There's a time for everything. <laughs>
and surely today isn't the time for that. Mr. Prime Minister, while you are being gone with this petrofin matter, could you give us an update on the status of the Minister of Energy? The information that we have at the level of the government is that he is scheduled for very serious surgery on Sunday, and we are praying for his successful recovery, and we will ask all of you to join us in your prayers, acknowledging that he is facing some very significant health challenges. Mr. Prime Minister, also on the matter of um, Petrochin, there's still a need and a needs among the population about this uh, threat of sh uh, strike action by the OWTU, as indicated. You have articulated a number of you know, possible solutions to the, to the situation. Is it that um, the, those who would have been meeting the union representative may not have articulated the position in the manner that you have so today? I can speak for that. What I do know is that the information available about Petrochin's ability to pay is not a secret. Um, in talking to the union, it would have been made visible in a trial in the court. It hasn't, it hasn't gone to a trial, but in a trial at the industrial court, the company will have to determine to the satisfaction of the court its ability or inability to pay. And the role of the shareholder has always to be taken into account. Um, the negotiations are taking place not with the government. They're taking place with the company owned by the public. By the public. And the role of the government at this stage is to ensure that all interests are well served, including the wider national interests. So much has been said about uh, profig profigacy, the word that you have used. Uh, profigacy. Profigacy, thank you. Um, the point being that, uh, you know, over the years, one would, the fact that um, Petrogen has become, as you put it, a ward of this, the it's state, the enough. treasury right now, would uh, possibly suggest that all may not have been well in terms of the financial dealings in the company over the past, I don't want to say five years, uh, but um, what, what is there that uh, the government may have uncovered that is worth legal action of some, of some kind? Well, let me get carried away with that, eh, because um, Petrochin had been a major contributor and continues to be a major contributor in more ways than one to our national economy. First and foremost, it provides the opportunity for a large number of citizens to get good jobs. That's a, that, that, that's a plus. And then, of course, in having those jobs, there's a cost to paying these workers. The company's earnings ought to be sufficient to pay the workers. That's a normal model. But there are times when certain things happen, not the least of which is that the commodity that Petrotrin trades in has been reduced in volume. We are now producing at the lowest level, where oil is concerned, the lowest level in 60 years or 65 years. Right? We are, in terms of oil production in Trinidad and Tobago, because we are a mature province, oil, field get, oil fields produce less and less oil as you keep taking oil out of them. And because we are an old oil producer, and we have not had a new oil find in this country for the longest while, our oil production has been doing what oil fields do, declining. We have now declined to the level in 2016, where we are producing approximately 65,000 barrels a day which is the lowest level in about 60 years. And then on top of that, the price of the product has plummeted from $140 a couple of years ago to $100, excuse me, excuse me. The price of the product, which is traded internationally, has plummeted from $120 to $100 to $80 to $60. And, in, and, and, and for our good luck, as we came into office in September 7, the price kept going down and reached as low as $28. And we were not the only people who were exposed to that, the world market. I was in, I was in Shell's office in London. Shell's a huge multinational, which is now in Trinidad and Tobago. I was there seeking Trinidad and Tobago's interests a few months ago, last year. 
And on that day when we were there meeting the head of Shell and the team from Shell, they were telling us, as we discuss our prospects in these parts, to attract their attention, they were losing $2 billion a day. Understand? All around the world, all people who were involved in oil and gas, particularly oil, have suffered significant loss of revenue because the market for the product collapsed. It has been, uh, in, in, well, Saudi Arabia is, is a class by itself. They've, they had a huge sovereign fund. The estimates that they've drawn down 75 billion from that. And they've done other things too. They cut public servants wages, they cut out subsidies and all that. So different countries handle it differently because the scale, I mean, we are dropping the ocean as compared to them. But all countries where the economy has been based on or involves hydrocarbons, particularly oil, has suffered significant loss of earnings. And we are not immune to that. In fact, as we check the situation, we might be the only country in the world that have not responded in the way that others have responded in the face of the declining revenues, and in our case, declining volumes. So this is a scenario. And whether I like it or you like it, or the, or, this is the scenario. We just have to be realistic and we have to be responsible. So therefore, could we turn to Sari, the matter of uh, diversification? You have mentioned the manufacturing sector and the creative industries as two of the lightning rods uh, for diversification of the economy. What the, the, issue, the issue before us is you don't build a fire brigade when the fire starts. You don't build a fire brigade when the fire has started. These are things we have to do, <coughs> we must do, but the issue that we're talking about with Petrochin and its challenges right now, diversification is not going to help us. We, we have to fix what is there. Petrochin is an oil and gas company. <coughs> right? So diversification is another story for another day. Tripartite Council, and what role is it playing in this particular um, standoff between Petrochem and Petrochem? Yeah. At the moment, I'm not aware it's playing any role. Um, because once the, once the union and the employer lock horns, I don't think that the, that process has a room for that. That process is supposed to prevent us from getting to where we are now, and unfortunately, it didn't. And I don't know to what extent. Um, this, because I must say, this situation moved very quickly from what I told you there about what was in the court for 2015, 2011 to 2015, and then the requirement to start a negotiation for the next period. This thing moved very quickly from that scenario of civility to one of strike action in a matter of a few weeks, I would say, a couple of weeks. But Let's trust the process. Can I ask you if there is any update with regard to sandals uh, in Tobago and uh, Clico, which is actually linked to the sandals project, proposed sandals project? No, Clico is not linked to the sandals project. Let me clarify that. The site that has been earmarked for the sandals project in Tobago is currently part of the Angostura package. And from that point of view, you can mention Clico. The government in talks and in expectation is owed significant sums of money, as we all know. And in view of payment for money owed to the government, the government has made um, overtures, which I have been told are positive, and the expectation is that we would um, have that property transferred to the state. In the meantime, we have, the government has formed a company to receive that property, and that company will be the company that will be interfacing with Sandals, being in ownership of the site. And let me just correct something here again, right? because it sounds nice, and some of you like to write it because it sounds nice, but it's far from a fact. And the more we tell you about it, the hotel is not being built on no man's land. I will lend you all a map 
so you could see what no man's land is. No man's land is a sand spit at the end of a little promontory. Nice beach close to uh, the lagoon. That is not where the hotel is being built. It's being built on land of Golden Grove Estate, of which this no man's land location is a part of the estate. But when you tell people you're going to build a hotel on, on no man's land, you're, in, you're inciting unnecessary negatives. There's, a, there's Golden Grove Estate, and I think a piece of Buku Estate. So if you know where no man's land is, place yourself there and move away from it. It's as you are moving away from it, you will be approaching the hotel site. So stop writing that it's being built on no man's land. In fact, when the hotel is built, you might go there on your honeymoon and you can walk. You will you, then be able to walk on the beach down to no man's land because no, man land, no man's land will remain no man's land. The, list, the sand spit will still be there, hopefully as clean and pretty as it is. But your hotel will not be on no man's land. Huh? Said when it's built or not if. Well, I am confident that um, all things being equal, if I borrow that from the economists, that this project will proceed. Um, we are at the stage now where we have exchanged, um, we, are, we, are ex we are exchanging confidentialities now, and very soon negotiations will take place and consultations will take place in Tobago, and that's the process. As soon as, uh, in, um, soon after the elections are over the consultations will begin, and uh, I hope that we can come to an agreement, and I expect that we will, and uh, then the project gets going. Because that, that project is important for Tobago. Is it not correct to say that that land is owned, the, the land to which you refer is owned by Clico? I, I, I just said to you, it's the, land, it's the Angostura land, and Angostura is owned by Clico? Isn't it, it Angostura land? Let me, not, let me not get into um, saying things I, I don't have the facts on. What I do know, it forms part of the package from Angostura owned by companies which are owned by CL, CL Financial, I think it is. Yeah. And, but the bottom line is, whoever is owned by in that group, the opportunity exists for the government to take land for cash. And that arrangement is on the table. A little bit further on what you said about Minister Khan as to whether he's hospitalized, his condition has deteriorated. He's at home. Further. He's at home. He has been examined by the local doctor, and he has serious heart, heart challenges, and he's due for um, medical due for surgery on Sunday. So he's yes, he's here. I think he, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where he's going to be. Where he's going to be. It's probably going to. But um, we were told that when he, while he was away, and he fell ill that Minister Inbert was acting for him. Is he still acting as Yes, a Minister Inbert is acting and will continue to act until Minister Khan is able to relieve him of it. But, but, um, is there any consideration that perhaps um, he might not be able to continue on with the, the energy portfolio at this point? Or? I told you I'm an optimist. I'm the other way around. I, would ex I am hoping and I'm expecting that his surgery will go well and he will come back to his job after. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. So I was wondering, uh, how beneficial would be a manpower audit of the police service when you have complained about the issue of being able to appoint a permanent police commission? Very beneficial to any person who is managing the police service to know who you have, where they are, how they function, quantity and quality, <coughs> and see what effect is having. So it doesn't matter who the commissioner is, whether he's a full-time or acting part-time, well, not part-time, but if he's in a substantive post. We <coughs> just have to work with what's available to us. We would have preferred to be in a better position because all of these kinds of things contribute to the ineffectiveness of the police service. But much as we don't like it, we have no choice but to work with what is there. We changed the order. <coughs> we changed the order in the way that we could have to facilitate an appointment of a commissioner. It was challenging the court. There were some decisions made. Um, the legal 
footwork is that the, the, the court order allows for certain things to happen at the commission. I really don't have an answer for you for what is happening at the commission. Because since that matter came out of the court, I don't see any urgency outside of the government to get a commissioner properly appointed. The government has no control over that. The matter is with the commission, and I, mean, I, I really have expressed my frustration over this on many occasions, and I won't do it again this time. One question on restoration. Um, the Hummingbird 3, that uh, famous uh, vessel, uh, was once um, indicated as needing um, restoration of kind uh, that was used by the laboratory and stored at the, um, I think, uh, somewhere in the South Key region. Any um, uh, plans about uh, restoring uh, that uh, particular vessel? I'm and afraid I won't be able to answer you on that. No, I don't have that information with me, so I'm not aware. So I'm sure it, that information can be made available to you later from the appropriate source, but I do not know at this time have that information. Speaking about hospitals, the two of them uh, come to mind. Any government um, plans on the St. Anne's Hospital upgrade? And also, from time to time, last year, uh, issues uh, cropped up at the forensic uh, department. Well, the government continues to maintain and utilize the St. Anne's Hospital as an integral part of the healthcare delivery system. I know there was talk about from a previous era about selling it and the, this government has no such plan. We are treating it as an integral part as is where is and we'll maintain it to ensure that proper health care is provided to those who require health care at that facility. With respect to the forensic center, um, we are moving towards the creation of the DNA lab. And one of the things that we discussed in this retreat is the whole question that, that what exists now, physical facilities, um, is an impediment. And we have to take steps to um, find a location for that. So we are attending to that, but that, that's a work in progress. Could I ask about two things? Um, on the question of the manpower audit, one of the main things that is also impacting on the ability to deal with crime is the criminal justice system. And I don't know if we have to do a manpower audit there, but it appears as though that is a major aspect of the institutional decay that is challenging the capacity of the country to deal with the criminal elements. What, what, what can be done about that? Because well, what think, accountability well, can you bring to bear? If you write it so eloquently as you've placed it, that would be a good summary of the situation. We can't bury our heads in the sand. That, and I think I spoke on this only a week ago, or two weeks ago. Justice in Trinidad and Tobago is not swift. And in some situations, justice is not being seen to be dispensed. And that automatically becomes a problem for the whole system of management of criminal conduct and treatment of persons who uh, run afoul of the law or who need to be adjudicated about by the courts. One more question. Another, another aspect of the accountability, which you also raised, public accountability. And one of the institutions where public accountability within recent times has come into focus is the office of the president. Recent reports, um, the, well, there was the issue of the housing allowance, which had been raised some time ago, and which had been brought back into the public domain, partly by the president himself, but also by um, other elements, social media elements, and so on. And the question is, what, th there is a gray area as to what happened with that housing allowance and where the locus of responsibility lay in terms of giving that housing allowance. The, the original position was the CPO, and doing it on behalf of the Salary Reviews Commission, which is the competent of, uh, body to make any adjustments um, supported by the cabinet, of course. So we are still, the public is still unclear whether that 
housing allowance was properly awarded? And is there a responsibility in terms of the government's goal to have public accountability in all sectors of the society? Is there a responsibility for the government to address what exactly happened with that housing allowance? And that is separate from the president and the personality. The CPO, which is an institution which falls under the government, granted the allowance, or at least that's what we are told. And there was a document which I had from the CPO given an interpretation of the Salary Review Commission's conditions, which appears to be just the CPO's interpretation. What role does the government have in addressing this matter? Because this is another institution, just like the criminal justice system, which is... Well, is there was a press conference that clarified that matter, or purported to clarify the matter, and no lesser person than His Excellency did clarify it for you, that it was done by the SRC in terms of the authority to do it. And um, now that this document has appeared in the public domain, I have not seen the document, I've only seen what is in the newspapers, that the SRC has distanced itself from any involvement in that matter. To answer your question as to the role of this government in that matter, I simply want to say that it appears to us that there is a requirement for the Auditor General, who is another arm of the state, to allay the public concern with respect to the propriety of that action. And if it is, as it appears, that public funds were improperly re um, received by any officer, and I'm not here identifying any particular officer, because it is not a, it's not, it's nothing new in the public service, because from time to time, matters of this nature will come to the cabinet where there's an overpayment or there's a an error and so on, and it is required to be rectified. But it usually comes after the Auditor General would have looked at the situation and make a determination as to whether the public funds have been properly received by the officer. And I think that is a good enough place for this matter to be properly rectified, failing which the unease that exists will continue. 